Well, if you're thinking, oh, great, he's going to tell us what the seven mountains are, and he's going to tell us what all these, uh, f you know, significant things are, not going to happen. <laughs> so, oh, well, last week you said you'd get back, you do some more studying on Armageddon, and then you come here and tell us more about Armageddon. Not going to happen. <laughs> We're getting towards the end of Revelation, and uh, this from chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, uh, all talking about the very last uh, times there of the wrath being poured out. And if you compare that to chapter, I think, 10 and 11, and kind of see that time period, we see it's around that time of that last seal. I'm not last seal, sorry, that last judgment being poured out, the last, uh, the seventh uh, tr uh, trumpet judgment, and then the vile judgment, as we see here in Revelation uh, 16. And, uh, and anyway, so there's, there's just a lot going on. Last week we had a visitor, and I thought, oh, man, terrible time for a visitor because it was, it was really hard for me to preach what, what was going on. I didn't feel prepared for that. And so today I kind of like made it a little more suitable for a Sunday morning. Like we got visitors. Maybe they'll be able to understand what I'm talking about a little bit more. And uh, no visitors, but that's okay. <laughs> It'll be a, a little bit of a, of a break from this. But what we're talking about is the end the very end times, there's a lot of speculation about who uh, the woman is, exactly who that uh, mystery Babylon. We've got that uh, that documentary that was out of uh, Babylon USA. Do we even have a copy of that anywhere, you know, with our documentary stuff up there? If anybody wanted to watch that or you could find it online, it's good. I actually watched it the other day again just to kind of recap in my mind uh, some of those some of those thoughts and Certainly, the U.S. being the last kind of superpower and uh, having just kind of like this, this goal, this global vision to like unify everybody and have a one world uh, order, we can see where some fulfillment of prophecy could take place. And this could be like that last nation. But we don't know. We just don't know. And like so many things, I don't think we will know until it all comes to pass. And actually, we won't even know then because we'll be gone <laughs> before they, uh, uh, probably before a lot of things happen in this, in, that, in this nation. But when we get to chapter 17, we see this, uh, this image here. Uh, often John's given another image where he sees something happen and it either maybe will, will clarify some things that he had just seen or something that he's about to see. And this image, this picture will help make a little bit more sense. Really, that's how God did prophetically to the Old Testament prophets as well. In fact, some of these, uh, in, some of these images are kind of like you could directly correlate them with Daniel. And so uh, we'll look at some of that here in a second. But what he sees here is a woman on a scarlet colored beast there in verse one and two there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying upon uh, unto me come hither i will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the king of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been uh, made drunk with the wine of her fornication all right and then verse three he sees uh, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And in my mind, I just kind of try to picture that. It's not very easy, but as a guy who is kind of, uh, you know, I like I like image images, and and I'm very visual in that way. I kind of try to picture what this looks like. And rising up is this huge red, uh, scarlet-colored beast with ten horns, and then there's this woman uh, riding upon it. And uh, it, let, me, let me make some of these, uh, let me talk a little bit about this picture that we're seeing. In chapter 12, verse 3, go back there, we have seen uh, the talk about the dragon, and it said, uh, oh, chapter 13, verse 3, and I saw, uh, no, verse 2, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet, no, I'm sorry, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. You see how that sounds very similar to what we read in chapter 17. Uh, verse thir uh, Chapter 13, uh, I'm sorry here, 13 verse, what did I tell you a minute ago? Did we look at 12? 12 verse 1 
Uh, uh, no, that's where I said three. 12 verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. So you see chapter 12, chapter 13, verse uh, 1. Chapter 17, we just read, uh, verse 3. Uh, she had the, it talked about the, uh, the heads there and the 10 horn, the seven heads and the 10 horns. Uh, now let's go to, let's see, 16 talks about it again. And the 10 horns, which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. Okay. It's talking about these are nations and peoples and they hate, they'll hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now let's go back to Daniel. Hold your place here. We'll come back in a minute. Daniel chapter 7. Now, I've said before, if you read Daniel 7 through Daniel 12, you will see so many similarities to the prophecies we see in Revelation. But without Revelation, you would have read Daniel and just kind of been like, I have no idea what it's talking about. By the time you get to Revelation, it really sheds light on what you have seen in Daniel and by the way, not the other way around. This is weird, but I, I don't know why, but growing up and knowing, uh, you know, people trying to explain prophecy to me, they would say, well, the key to understanding Revelation is Daniel. And I say it's the other way around. The key to understanding Daniel is <laughs> Revelation. Uh, we, you know, so no, you have to look at it through Daniel and you have to see, you know, who he was talking about and, and who this, uh, the tribulation is for and all these kinds of things they would say. And you don't know that unless you read Daniel. And I'm thinking, no, you don't understand Daniel unless you read Revelation, right? That just makes a whole lot better sense uh, in the way that God re reveals stuff throughout time. Like I said, there's some things that Daniel predicted. They didn't even know who the next nations were, were going to be. You know, the, the, the image of the gold head and after that will be the, uh, the silver, you know, the arms and the breastplate. Well, that's the Medes and the Persians. Daniel knew a little bit about that later on, not when he made the prophecy, but later on. He didn't know about the Grecian Empire that was going to come up and, and uh, the Roman Empire after that. And so all these prophecies were, you know, nobody would have understood those until later. And I, I am submitting that the same thing's true for us. Nobody's really going to know, you know, what everything's going to happen. We can speculate. We can look at the world today and the, the governments and who's... Uh, you know, kind of in bed with whom and, and what they're, they're doing. And we could just kind of speculate. But the truth is that in, in, in a way, it doesn't really matter. What we know is that there's going to happen. There is going to be uh, this, uh, this world empire that is in the final day is going to be judged with. Uh, judged. And so we see this uh, beast having seven heads, ten horns. It's going to explain who those are. And then it talks about them being, uh, uh, oh, I didn't even read it. Daniel 7, 7, 7, 7. Daniel, let's see here, 7, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns, and I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom were the, uh, uh, there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and the mouth speaking great things. Uh, and it can, continues to talk about that. Like I said, all these, these last few chapters of Daniel really line up with the imagery that we see in uh, Revelation. Look at verse 20. You're in Daniel 7, verse 20. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of the horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose uh, look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. And so that's ultimately what's happening. Eventually the saints will possess the kingdom. Right now, what we're reading here, we know now from Revelation that for a period of time, the saints are taken out and removed while God pours out his wrath upon them. And uh, we'll get to that here in a minute. Notice uh, verse, let's see, verse. Yeah. Anyway, this uh, whole section here in, in chapter seven talks about these kinds of things. And then it says in uh, Revelation 17 that 
She's drunken with the blood of the saints. We just read that in Daniel, this idea about, uh, you know, making war with the saints and killing the saints uh, until that, that time comes, ancient of days. So she has, uh, so picture the imagery in your head. You know, you're just looking out. Let's say this is a dream or something that you're watching on a TV screen or something, and you see this beast coming up, red beasts, ten horns, uh, I mean, ten, uh, uh, yeah, seven heads, ten horns, and drunken with the blood of the saints. You're thinking maybe a little, not to be gruesome, but a little blood coming down from the mouth and, and just this real gory picture. And in my mind, when I started reading that and thinking about that, it reminded me of my teen years. Now, it's been a while, and I'm going to date myself here in a minute. It's been a while since, uh, since uh, you know, I was really into video games. But as a teenager, I played video games like the, like the rest of them. And, uh, and all the video games had this thing in common. The, mo the majority of the types of video games I played anyway, they had these bosses. At the end of each level, there was a boss. And you had to fight that boss. And then, uh, you know, you'd go to the next level. At the end of that level there'd be another boss. And it would always be like, oh, the music starts playing. Doo, 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 doo. And you wait for the boss to come up, and here's this boss. And I could picture in my head this final boss, if you will. I think maybe this might be a different word. I don't know, but maybe it's called a super boss as well. That final boss that comes up, and doo, 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 you see this red dragon. Doo, doo, doo. <laughs> I mean, this red beast, I mean, and the woman sitting on it with blood in her mouth. And, and they're gonna, she's going to cause war with the, with the saints, and your, your job to defeat that. That's what I'm thinking about in my head, right? This final boss. And, uh, and so uh, my, I'm, I'm thinking in those terms, using that imagery in your mind. Here's a few points I want to make. Okay, number one, the final boss is the source of all the other bosses. Okay, now I, I think that's pretty much true in the video game world. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what video games you played. I, I, I don't know. The one that in my mind is just always Super Mario Brothers because that was like the big thing. I, I know that dates me. That's like way at, nobody even plays that anymore. But that was like the thing. And what's the name of the big boss? Come on, all you carnal minded people. What was the big boss in the Super Mario Brothers? King Koopa. Right. But then there was all these other little he's like a big turtle, right? With spikes on his back and everything. Now is it ringing a bell? How about Super Mario Kart? All right, you <laughs> a little more your generation, and <laughs> so uh, uh, and then there was this you know this big king at the very end I guess that you had to kill. But but if you think about it, they were all somehow related together. And other games you might have played, you know, where hey, where like there's this big mother ship or whatever, and it's controlling all these others that you've been fighting throughout the whole game. I don't have a lot of examples in my head. Sorry, but. You understand what I'm going for. <laughs> you know, there's this final boss that comes up, and it's all the this final boss is the source of all the other bosses. Okay, so it's no surprise since Genesis three, even before that, I guess Genesis two, we know who the final boss is, right? It's not a surprise. Who is it? Who's the final boss? Satan, okay, he's the final enemy that's going to be destroyed. We understand that. But he is the source of all the other bosses that have been fought and that have been fought all through the, the game, if you will, that, that we've been in. Okay, and uh, look at Daniel chapter 10 again. Hold your place. Uh, well, actually, before you go there, go to Ephesians. Ephesians 6. In verse 12, you know, I hate to call it a game because I realize it's not a game, but it's just this, you know, this, uh, this journey that we got to go through, you know, this temporary journey that we got to go through till we reach eternity. And so I'm comparing it to a game and, uh, notice this, that in Ephesians six, verse 12, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, so you get the idea there. We're not fighting against human flesh and blood enemies. We are fighting against something far more powerful and something that's of a spiritual nature and something that we can't really see. But he describes them as principalities. 
Okay, so that word, think about the word in principalities, the word prince. All right, now the Bible's going to say a lot about that. Look at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, let's start in verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken uh, such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lip, and I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, be the vision my sorrow, uh, uh, I'm sorry, by the vision, by the, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of, of this my Lord talk with uh, this my, how could the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me straightway there remaineth no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man. And he strengthened me and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then saith he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. For I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. See how he's talking about Michael, which we know is an angel, right? Michael, Michael the archangel is what we call him. And, and it's talking about how he is a prince. And he's fighting against the prince of Persia. Interesting. Who was the world leader at that time? Uh, we went from Nebuchadnezzar to the Medes and the Persians. Okay, so we're talking about the prince of Persia. Who followed? Who was the next great kingdom leader of that day after the Medes and the Persians? It was Greece. Alexander the Great came up and everything. And so he's saying, hey, I had to fight with the prince of Persia. And after that, I'm going to fight with the, the prince of, uh, uh, of Grecia. Hey, he's not talking about Alexander the Great. He's talking about a spiritual force that a spiritual angel was going to be fighting against. There's this battle going in the spiritual world. And, uh, and, and so this word prince is used right there. Now notice, uh, <clears throat> uh, notice uh, Ephesians 2, verse 2. And let me just say, if, if you know, so if, if there's all these world empires that have uh, there's world leaders that have controlled kind of the, the main events that are going on in the world and controlling all the wars and controlling all these kinds of things. And if there's any world leader today, then let me ask you this. Where do you think Satan and his minions, his spiritual forces, if you will, where do you think they're hanging out today? Oh, I'm sure Satan walks around the earth trying to seek whom he may devour. I'm sure there's there's demons in your life trying to oppress you and trip you up and cause you to stumble. I'm sure there's spiritual uh, wickedness all around us that we're fighting on a daily basis. But when you talk about where the main events being done, the main work where the princes are fighting and all that kind of stuff, the spiritual warfare that's going on, don't you think it's going to be in the White House? <laughs> don't you think it's going to be probably in the Middle East and in Russia and all these world leaders. And when you listen to anything on the news, which I don't trust anything on the news anymore, I'm just telling you, but when you watch anything and it's talking about all these world leaders meeting and they're getting together and they're doing this and they're doing that, you scratch your head thinking, Why, what are they doing? Why are they trying to even talk about you know, uniting together or doing this and that? And, and, and you, you just don't understand what's going on. But the truth of the matter is, there is no way to know what's going on. What's going on is spiritual. We don't know. We can't, we can't actually 
uh, fight against the physical part of it because it's way beyond the physical. There's spiritual stuff going on. I suspect there are world leaders possessed with the devil. <laughs> there are world leaders influenced heavily uh, by demonic forces. You say, well, that's a conspiracy theory. No, I think this is pretty biblical. This is what God, what God is showing us that happens. Now, could there possibly be good people out there that are involved in politics? I su suspect that they could, but the, definitely Satan is going to attack those world leaders because they're the ones that are controlling everything in this world. Now, how about uh, what does the Bible say about Satan? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now the Bible describes Satan as being the God of this world, right? God, you, we, we want to say, no, 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 God's in control. Well, he is ultimately. Nobody can do something without God's permission. But God has put us in a position in this fallen earth, in this corrupted earth, where he's put a course of things into action. We know what's going to happen in Revelation. But up until that point, Satan is controlling the things in this world. Now, God will use him to do his work. So sometimes it's confusing because it sounds like in the Bible that God's the one doing the destruction. Well, he is in a sense because he's allowing Satan to do certain things. And so he's not, it's not a surprise to him. Nobody is, uh, you know, really overcoming the Lord. All right. But there is this spiritual battle going on, the spiritual wickedness uh, in high places. <clears throat> And we'll come back to Ephesians 6 where I talked about that, uh, that verse, the whole armor of God and all that in the, in the minute. If you think about all the, uh, again, the evil bosses, if you will, of the, 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 the evil leaders of this world throughout history. And you, I mean, you just take somebody. Now, we tend to think because of the history books and what's in it, you try to think about Hitler or somebody like that. And you think, well, how could that person have had so much power? And how could he have done all this stuff? Well, that's no surprise whatsoever. And he's just one. He's the one that gets the most attention. But look, every world leader has been wicked. Uh, the, because Satan is setting them up, you know, for this big day. And he's bringing all these uh, forces together. Now, the, so the first point was this, that the final boss that we're talking about here, this final boss. Now, in this case, it's talking about these nations, which it describes as this, this whore uh, sitting upon. Now, you think about a whore, uh, which is the Bible, biblical word here, but you think about a whore as opposed to like a chaste virgin, which is what, how God defines uh, his, the saints, right? And you've got the New Jerusalem coming down like a bride, and, and you think about a chaste version, a whore is like the exact opposite of that, right? A whore is somebody that, you know, the enemy just uses and then discards whenever he's done with them, right? This is what's going on. Satan is just using all this, and in the end, they're going to be destroyed. And so, in the, and so you kind of get that picture of what's going on. So anyway, you see this, this image, and it's, but, but all throughout history, that's been the case. All these wicked, all this wickedness that's gone on in the world, all the wicked leaders and what have you, all empowered by Satan himself. Since Genesis, it's not a surprise to us. We see it all throughout the Bible, and then we see it in uh, even in Revelation. So we know that that's the case. And I'm really looking forward to getting to Revelation 20, where we can come finally read the end of Satan <laughs> and see what that finally is like. But in the meantime, we're seeing the very last war. Uh, being fought. Okay, so the second point that I want to make is this. <clears throat> we're going to, by the way, not, we're going to be part of lots of battles in our life. Not maybe the, the final battle. We might not be there for that. But we're going to be part of many of these battles along the way. And uh, what we read in Ephesians 6 said that we wrestle not against, uh, you know, flesh and blood, but against principalities and all that. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 13. So what do we do? Well, we have to, we have to suit up. Now, again, you hold your place there in Ephesians 6, but come, uh, let me just get show of hand. Who has played video games like I'm talking about? There's a big boss at the end and all that. Okay, everyone, male, female. Okay, most of them know what I'm talking about. All right. Now, if you know you're getting to the end of a level, 
and the big boss is fixing to come up and you have like one you know life left depending on how the game does it like you got like let's say it's like four hearts and you only got one heart left you have no weapons uh and you know you're getting ready to fix the battle what you're likely to do is just die and start all over again so that you can enter into that a save point or something like that and just save it and then you die and try to get something because you know you need to be prepared you need to be suited up or else you don't stand a chance against this uh this boss okay again i grew up super mario brothers now I, i'm sorry if you missed that generation you didn't get to play super mario brothers but i'm going to tell you a secret okay before you place before you go and you play against the big boss you have got to have, what was it, max lives, like 100 lives or something like that. You've got to have all your lives ready, or else you're not going to make it. And so what you do, if you're not familiar with how this works, I'm sorry, okay, you missed it. But what you have to do is you have to go jump on a turtle towards the end of the game. One time, you jump on the turtle, he flips over like this. You pick up the turtle, if I remember right. <laughs> you carry it over to the stairs. This is a secret, okay? <laughs> And you jump on the end of the turtle, and it hits the stair, and it comes back, and, and, and there's this, this phenomenon that happens where you can keep jumping up and down on it, and it goes, do 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 extra lives. And you get those extra lives all the way up to 100 lives. Now you're ready to go face the enemy. In fact, what you might do is go ahead and get that last flower, I think it is, and if you get that flower, it gives you firepower. That's going to help you. You want to be completely suited up <laughs> for that final battle, okay? So look back at Ephesians chapter 6. We could talk about Donkey Kong. We could talk about Contra. Did anyone ever play Contra? Okay, Contra is the first place I ever learned that, uh, what's it called, that secret code. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, select, start. You've heard of it. Once you do that, you've got like so many lives that you can finally win the game. If you don't get that, if you don't get use that secret code and get all your lives, you're probably not going to win the game. <laughs> okay, Ephesians 6, verse 13. So here's what we have to do before we fight the big bosses, okay? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, all right, during the battle, if you will, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So what do we have? We have uh, the girding of your loins with truth. Now, by the way, look, there are a lot of Christians who don't suit up for the armor, and guess what? They don't win the battle. Game over. Now, the, the game's still going on. <laughs> there are still believers. There's still a remnant who's, who's making it. But these people who don't suit up, they didn't make it. They didn't make it. Okay? So, uh, so what we're looking at is being able to withstand in the evil day. And here's what you got to do. First of all, you have to gird your loins with the truth. Now, girding your loins was something that often was re referred a, a reference to like a, in a battle. You know, you don't want to uh, think about it like this, okay? A, a, gir a girdle is a belt, all right? You, you, have you seen guys walking around? I don't even know if it's a thing. Now. I think it's still going on. And their pants are like two sizes way too big for them, maybe 10 sizes way too big for them, falling down, you know? Could you imagine trying to run <laughs> in a battle? You know what I mean? <laughs> pants are falling down. You're not ready, man. You got to pull those things up. You got to cinch your belt up, right? And so the idea is that you gird your loins, similar idea. They had to gird everything they had on and make sure it was tight. It's not going to fall off while they're in the battle. And it says, gird your loins with truth. We need to be ready with truth. We need to study the Bible. We need to be able to understand uh, what God's word says, because God is the only one strong enough to defend 
Satan or his minions, that he, and the principalities that he throws at us. We can't do it in ourselves, so we have to suit up with the armor that he provides. It's kind of like a little cheat code, all <laughs> right? So go to uh, 1 Peter and look at this real quick. 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is that is in you with meekness and fear. That's second. Uh, I mean, that's first Peter uh, three fifteen. OK, be ready. Be ready. That's the key. I, I've shared this story before. I won't get into all the details, but I remember somebody coming to my door with a Bible in his hand. And I had just recently met him, started trying to talk to him about the Bible and about his salvation. And he came and I knew he wasn't saved, uh, but I was going to go talk to him. You know, I was trying to set it up so I can go talk to him. And he came to the door with the Bible in his hand and he said, hey, could you tell me what this one verse means? And it was some real obscure verse. And I was like, you know, you kind of threw me off guard. I'm not really ready to give you an answer for that, but I'm getting ready to go do something. Let me come over to your house tomorrow and tell you what that says. And I was thinking in my head, well, regardless of what verse he showed me, I'm going to turn that into a gospel presentation and make sure this guy's saved. And uh, anyway, next day I go to show up at his door, and he moved away. I've never seen him since. I always hope that he'll move back to Iola and I'll find him. Uh, but I think, man, I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared. I know he wasn't asking me to give him a gospel presentation, but we need to always be prepared with the gospel presentation. Always be prepared. Somebody might ask why we use the King James, why, you know, uh, uh, what we think about baptism, well, all these things that we talk about in our faith. Uh, you know, there's certain things you don't need to get hung up on, but the main essential doctrines, uh, we need to be ready to explain those things. And that's going to keep us from falling into, uh, you know, false teachings and and the things that will lead us lead us astray. Okay, so gird up your loins with truth. He says, wearing the breastplate of righteousness. If we're going to fight this battle, we're going to have to be righteous people. I was talking about this morning, uh, talking about prayer and what to ask God for in, in 2021. And, uh, and one of the things I talked about is the fact, and it's come up many, many times, but it's so true. You want to have a good prayer life. You want to ask the Lord for big things. You want to see Him work in your life. <clears throat> if you're struggling with wickedness, you're struggling with the open sin, you regard iniquity in your heart, the Bible says God's not going to hear you. And if you're not living a righteous life, your prayers are going to be hindered. You're not going to be equipped for the battle, and you're not going to be able to come out victorious. Okay? It says you're having your feet shod. That's basically putting shoes on. Okay, Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, I love how uh, the Bible talks a lot about, you know, how, how good it is for those who bring good news. You know, beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. The Bible talks about how we are, uh, there's a, uh, a, a, let me read, uh, James 5.20 says this, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. Well, praise the Lord for that. Not only that, it goes on to say this, and shall hide a multitude of sins, <laughs> right? So you, you want to hide that person's sins. You want to be pleasing to God. Look, you're going to have to try to convert the sinner from the error of his ways. 1 Peter 4, 8, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. And so we need to live with this... Uh, uh, right, this breastplate of righteousness, feet shod, preparation of gospel of peace, gird loined about with truth. And this is, these are the types of things that are going to help us be victorious in the battle. Then the Bible talks about the shield of faith. We really can't do anything without faith. I mean, how do you fight an enemy you can't even see? A spiritual uh, battle of power, the powers of the air, principalities. How can you even fight that? Well, you're going to have to guard up by faith and do the things that the Bible tells you to do, whether you understand them or not. Whether they're hard or not, you're going to have to do it by faith. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, right, which is the Word of God, and praying in the Spirit. These are the things that are going to help us. But we can't expect to fight the battle, to fight any of the 
the little battles or the little bosses that come up in this uh, uh, in the in our life that are spiritual battles. And so finally, uh, kind of a conclusion here. Number three is thankfully we will just be cheering on the Lord as He destroys the final boss. <laughs> All these other bosses, we need to suit up. Come on, I need, the, I need the suit of armor. I need the protection. I need the secret codes. I need some kind of protection from this boss because I can't do it. All right, so we need all that we can, all the help that we can get. But this time period that we're talking about, remember, uh, we're, we, we've had the rapture already. We've been raptured out. If you're, if you're saved, uh, believer, you've been raptured out. Uh, the two witnesses are gone. We won't take the time to look there, but in chapter 11, it talks about the two witnesses. Now, we don't see that when we get to chapter 17. It's not talking about the witnesses. But if you compare the two, you had those witnesses there right up at the very end before the seventh seal is poured out, and they're dead in the streets. And the wicked you know, leaders think that they've won, and they've conquered these men of God. And we finally got rid of you know, uh, these preachers or whatever. And they're lying in the street dead, and then God uh, allows them to come back fr from the dead and resurrect. And then it's like earthquakes and all this kind of stuff in, it, in this final final gathering together, in this final uh, uh, battle, if you will, takes place. But, uh, but we're already gone. The two witnesses are gone. The 144,000 are apparently still here. Maybe they're going to be part of that final battle. Uh, and then we come back in our glorified bodies after Jesus has cleansed the earth. So that last battle, uh, we don't even fight. Now, I don't know if you ever played, again, one of those video games where you are so powered up, you're so, you have so many weapons, you have all the things, it's just kind of like you just press the button and then you just watch and it just does the whole thing for you, right? This is kind of how it is. That final battle, we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about it. We're out of here. We're just watching the Lord take care of His business. So if it's Jesus who wins that final battle, then we understand that all these other battles that are going to take place between now and the time that He comes, right? the only way that we're going to win those battles are we need to be walking in Christ. John 15, right? Like He preached. We need to be uh, uh, abide in the vine and walk with Christ and do things in His part. Without Him, we can do nothing. And so we need to stay suited up, uh, guard, uh, armed with the truth, armed with the Word of God, and protected from all the evils of this world because there's going to be a lot of evil days come between now and then. But that final battle, aren't you glad we're not even going to be here, but we're going to, we're going to enjoy knowing that God is at the final uh, victory and the Lamb is going to rule, okay? And He's going to come back into His kingdom just like Daniel said and all the prophets said and just like we read in Revelation. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word and the great truth uh, that that you will rule and reign for uh, eternity. And we await that, that time. Lord, as we see the day approaching, help us just to uh, continue to be strong, uh, encouraging one another, meeting together, exhorting one another. Help us uh, keep focusing on you to, guard our, to arm ourselves uh, with the armor of God and help us keep walking, Lord, in patience and in faith and faith. And Lord, uh, just guide and protect this your church. Help us to do mighty things in 2021 for your honor and glory, not for our own. And, uh, and we know that you'll do that. We'll give you the praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.